Hello again, and welcome back to another episode of Adding Game Sounds, where today we're going to be looking at Ellen's bullets. We're going to be seeing if we can make them a bit more interactable or a bit more responsive, rather, I suppose, uh, to the things they hit. Before we start, I just want to mention that the F Modern Unity Essentials course, a course designed for teaching designers how to implement audio into Unity games using FMOD, will be available between the 8th and the 12th of April, with a little pre-launch between the 6th and the 7th of April. I'll have a link in the description so you can check it out if you want to learn more about it. You can also use the code SGS underscore bonus for 20% off. But with that out of the way, let's jump into our bullets. And the first thing we're going to do is go into FMOD. I'm going to take a look at some new events I've been uh, messing around with and creating. Uh, particularly this one here, Bullet Impact. So, if you remember back to the uh, enemy lesson, we created a new event for the uh, Spitter enemy, and it was a Spit Impact event. And the idea was this would play whenever the, a Spit projectile hit us, the player, Ellen. So if I quickly remind you of how that sounds. It was just a simple one shot. It, the sound was always going to play those two files uh, whenever it hit Ellen. With the Bullet Impact event, however, it's going to work slightly differently. So the way this works is that when this event is called, depending on the value of the bullet collide parameter, we're basically going to be triggering one of two events. The way we do that is using these two things here. These are called event instruments. And what they do is simply when they're triggered, instead of playing a single audio file, they'll actually play another event that we've got here in our event browser. So let's have a quick look at the two events I've created for these two event instruments. The first being bullet impact object. And the purpose of this is to play whenever the bullet hits a wall or something that's not going to take damage. The idea is that the bullet is just going to fizzle out and not make much of an impact. So it sounds like this. Cool, nice and simple. Uh, as you can see, I've made it using uh, a combination of a lot of instruments. Uh, obviously, you could do this in a door and just prepare it beforehand, but this way you do get a bit of a variety every time it's played. So the Ellen ranged attack has some pitch modulation going on, no volume, uh, and it just plays as it is normally, like that, with some fades, obviously, as you can see. Next, we have the Fizzle track. This plays another uh, audio file called Acid Pool Splash 2. Uh, took some volume off of it. I uh, don't think I did much else to this. Again, it's just a simple audio track. In fact, should we have a quick listen to them individually? That might be a good idea. So let's have a quick listen to Fizz. Little bit, that's the kind of sci fi -y fizzly sound. Well, this is the fizzly sound, I suppose. So I'm using the high end of the pool splash sound to give us that kind of, well, high end. And then uh, this normal bullet sound is gonna be obviously, you know, the bullet itself, but it's kind of been edited so that it's not very loud, it's not very impactful. In fact, I believe, we'll get onto it in a bit more detail, but as you can see, I've done some EQ to remove some low end. Uh, so that's the purpose of those two there. Next, we've got a rubble track. Now, this is a multi-instrument containing footsteps, but the idea is this is supposed to sound like the crumbling of a wall that uh, the bullets hit, because there's a lot of brick walls in this. So there you go, that's one of the footsteps, and obviously you can hear, because the footsteps touch the ground, there's a bit of an earthy sound to it. So a couple of these in a multi-instrument, playing randomly, gives us that kind of earthy texture that we'd expect to hear. And I've done that a few times with different footsteps. So this one is the stone. There we go, and this one is, uh, I'm not even sure actually, let's have a listen. Okay, so a different footstep type. Okay, cool. So all these combined, randomly playing footsteps will basically add up for, like I said, a, a, a material, a kind of either an earthy, stony feel that you'd expect to hear when these bullets hit the wall. Uh, and yeah, let's have a listen to that all together one more time. There we go, all combined to make a really weak sounding impacting bullet, which is the idea. And like I said earlier, we've got some EQ going on. So I took a lot of the low end out because you know you don't want a lot of energy, a lot of low end in this because then it would sound a bit more heavy hitting, which is not all we want. We want this to sound weak. Uh, and a little bit of mid as well. And that was pretty much it. So this acts as a one shot. Uh, whatever it's called, it will just play the uh, all the audio files as they are, just like that. Next event is called Bullet Impact Enemy, and the idea is this is going to play when the bullet hits an enemy. So the first file is uh, just simply the Ellen Ranged Attack 04 file that's been trimmed down, faded in. Uh, this is going to, again, sound a bit sci-fi-y. This is going to be like the electricity and the energy of the bullet, so let's have a quick listen. There we go. As you can see, there's quite a bit of pitch modulation to give this a lot of variation and a touch of volume automation as well. Wow, there, was, there really was a lot of volume, uh, not volume, pitch uh, modulation. Let's have a few listens to this actually to see the difference. Can 
Okay, so you get some a lot of variation. This you don't have to modulate as much as I have. That's just clean what I went for when I did this. And uh, next is the meat track. This plays the chomper die audio file. Uh, so I'm all fading out, adjust to the level. Uh, but again, this is a pretty simple layer. There we go. So the idea of this is to sound like you know the enemy's burst when it explodes. In fact, you'll see in a bit when the bullet hits the enemy, it does look like it's exploded. So this works quite well. And the last is the fizzle uh, track. And this again is the high end. We're using the acid pool splash to get that the fizzly sound that they captured. Because uh, you you know you'd expect something from a bullet that looks like it's made of plasma. Uh, so it makes sense. And uh, let's quickly have a listen to that. There we go. And then all together we get this. Cool, so that one's got a bit more impact, and it's a bit more meaty, which is the idea, because it's hitting an enemy. Uh, and then a bit more EQ to take some low end out, but not too much this time. In fact, I might even just tweak it a bit more. I might leave it like that, there we go, cool. Uh, and those are the two uh, events that we're gonna play. And like I said, we're not going to be playing these events directly in Unity. We're gonna be playing them through the Bullet Impact event exclusively. So depending on what value this parameter is on, either anywhere between one and uh, whatever number that was, 1.47 I think, 1.49, uh, it will play the bullet impact on the object, then anywhere above 0. Point, sorry, 1.5 and 2, it will play the bullet impact on the enemy. Now, uh, if you're using f 2.0, uh, you might be thinking, why is he using a continuous parameter? Well, that's because I'm still using fmod 1.10.10 uh, and it doesn't have discrete parameters. For those of you who aren't using FMOD 2.0 and haven't used it yet, basically in FMOD 2.0 you get discrete parameters that they don't that don't go up in decimal places like this one does. They go up in integers, so you could have a parameter that could only range between one and two, and that's it, nothing in between, which would actually work really well for this. Therefore, we could we wouldn't have this little gap in the middle. Uh, we wouldn't have to sort of scroll through every value to get to the one we want. It would just be one or the other. And because there's only two options that we want this parameter to land on, that would actually work perfectly for us. Sadly, that's not an option with this version, uh, but we can still make it work. So with that, let's quickly press F7, double check I've built all my banks, and let's jump into Unity. Okay, so what we're gonna wanna do is come over to the project tab, search bullet, and we're gonna wanna find our bullet prefab, which we've looked at a couple of times before in this series. So let's click open prefab. Now, if you remember back to the enemy lesson we had not too long ago, uh, that used two scripts, the bullet, or sorry, that <laughs> that had uh, spit projectiles in it. If you remember the spitter enemy, fired these little blobs of goo, uh, and they basically work the same as the bullets do that Ellen fires. They're just, physics are a little bit different. But they both use the bullet script and the damage script. And we're going to utilize both of these to uh, trigger those sounds we just looked at. If you remember last time on uh, the bullet script, we made an extra event called the impact event. And for the spit projectile, we set its event to play the spit impact event. Obviously, because this is for the bullet, we wanna set our event differently. So make sure you go to the search button, find your bullet impact uh, event. Not these two, remember, we're gonna call these two uh, here, enemy and object. We're gonna call them through the bullet impact event itself. Make sure you've got that selected. Uh, once you've done that, we can jump into the script and have a look at how we set it up. Okay, so let's just quickly cover a few things that we know already about this script. We know we've got a uh, event instance called PE, which fires uh, either, uh, in fact, I'll play them in F mode as I describe them. So either, depending on the object this script is attached to, it'll either play this spit event, or, and if I can quickly find it, I think it's under Ellen, it will play the Ellen ranged event. So depending on which uh, one you select, it'll play one of those two. And the idea is this is the sound you'll hear as soon as the projectile leaves wherever it came from. So whether it's the enemy or whether it's Ellen firing her gun. Next, we have a playback state. We didn't really talk about too much this in the last lesson, but this one is gonna come in, into, it's gonna be important in this one. Then we have a string called impact event, which we looked at earlier. That's gonna reference the event path of uh, the impact event we want to play. Now if we scroll down a bit, the next time we see our audio is in the on enable function. So when the uh, bullet is fired and the game object uh, that we are looking at or this script is gonna be attached to is enabled, uh, the PE event instance variable will have the an instance of the projectile event stored inside it. Then using the get playback state uh, command, we're going to hook the PE event instance uh, to the PB state uh, playback state, uh, which we'll be using in a little bit. So when we uh, check the playback state, we'll be basically checking the condition of the event stored within PE. Next, we're using the attach instance to game object event. 
uh, command, sorry. This is going to make the event uh, 3D, basically. Uh, so both, all of these events we're talking about have the FMOD spatializer component attached because we want them to be three-dimensional. We want them to pan and attenuate the volume depending on their location. Uh, so just make sure you add this line. It's quite important. Uh, so we want to add the event instance we're talking about. So that's PE. Add the transform of the game object that this script uh, is attached to. And also get the rigid body if there is one. Well, actually, I think you have to get the rigid body anyway. So just get the rigid body using get component. Then in these two triangle brackets, add rigid body 2D. We've done this stuff before. I'm sure you guys know how to do it. Then all that's left to do is tell it to start, play the event, and then tell it to release once the event has finished playing. Cool. Nice and simple stuff. Now the next section we want to look at is the fixed update function. Now you can see we have an if statement which has a variable destroy when out of view. Now this is a boolean. It's checking to see it's true or false. Obviously we know that. Uh, it's basically checking to see if the bullet uh, is out of view of the camera. And if it is, uh, we're going to basically do everything in here. And the main bit we want to focus on is this other if statement down here. Originally, uh, this is what your script will look like by the way. You won't have all this. Let's quickly delete that. This is what, in fact, you won't have all this either, so let's delete that as well. This is what you'll see. It will say, if on screen is false, which we know by the exclamation mark, uh, then the bullet pool object will return to pool. Now, we talked about this before. By returning to pool, basically, uh, in this game, these objects, the spit projectile and the bullet, they're designed to be sort of cloned in uh, multiple times to the scene. Uh, so, you know, multiple versions of that prefab we looked at can be used. Now, uh, to save Unity juggling loads and loads of uh, copies of this prefab at once, there's uh, what's called a, a pool of these objects. It's basically like eight or so copies of this prefab that get recycled in and out of the game as you use them. So for example, with a bullet, if you're firing your gun a lot, you're using the same eight bullets that are just being pulled in and out of the game. So in other words, this is basically getting rid of the bullet. That's all we need to know from that. So when the bullet is not on screen, uh, the bullet's gonna disappear. Now we want to change that. We don't want to get rid of the bullet object as soon as it disappears off screen. If we do, if we leave it like this, uh, all our events, all of our sounds will be told to stop and we don't want that to happen. So what we do is we add the line I just got rid of. So we will only return the uh, object to the pool uh, if it goes off screen and if the playback state we created earlier is not playing. In other words, if the PE event uh, is not playing. So once it's finished playing, then it will be returned to pool because both of these conditions will be true. So that's a nice easy way of making sure all your events get heard before the object is taken away and destroys your instances, essentially. Right, so the next thing we're gonna do is come down here and we're going to look at these events here. Now, the last time we looked at the bullet script, we only had two functions here. We had one called on hit non damageable, and we had another called on hit damageable. However, now you can see uh, there's two on hit damageables, one for the spit projectile, the other for the bullet projectile. The way I created this uh, was basically just copy the one we had, which was originally just on hit damageable, and then change the names of the two. So the idea is we're going to call these uh, two functions depending on what object this uh, script is working for. So if this script is working for the spit projectile, it's only going to call this one when the spit hits something that could be damaged. Uh, and if it's on the bullet, the bullet, this one, this function will be called if the bullet hits something that could be damaged. We also talked about last time, uh, anything in this game that can be damaged has a script on it called damageable. Uh, in that script, obviously, is a class called damageable, which is what this is referencing here. This parameter is taking that script, or that class rather, uh, storing it inside the damageable parameter variable and using it inside this to, you know, do whatever. So with that in mind, we're going to quickly pause uh, looking at this script and we're going to jump back into Unity. I'm going to go back to the damager script. Now, you'll remember last time we talked about the damager script. This is what calls those functions I just showed you. So uh, it should for you, you should see that it says bullet uh, on hit damageable instead of on bullet hit damageable. So once you've added these two functions to your script, you're going to want to come here. Uh, you're going to want to hit the, well, first you're going to want to remove the one that says just on hit damageable. Then you're going to want to come to the plus sign down here. You're going to want to drag the bullet game object from the hierarchy into this little slot here. Oh, whoops, I missed. <laughs> Let's try that again. There we go. And then you're going to want to find the function that we're calling. So like I said, we want to go to the bullet script and we want to find the on hit bullet hit damageable function because this is for the bullet. Now I've already done this as you can see, so I'm just going to quickly delete that there. 
Now, bearing in mind, you'll also want to change this for the spit projectile as well. So once you've uh, saved your script and added these functions, type in spit in the project tab, click on your spit projectile, open it, and come down to the damage script and just make sure uh, on the on damage will hit box here, you do the same thing I've just showed you and make sure that you're not using the on hit damageable function, but instead of using the on spit hit damageable function. So once you've done that, let's quickly go back to the bullet uh, prefab. Here we go. So like I said, the idea is depending on what object these two scripts are attached to, uh, when either of those objects, either the spit projectile or the bullet, hit something that can be damaged, they are going to call uh, one of these functions depending on which one they are. Nice and easy. Jumping back into our script now, make sure you copy these functions as I've got them out here before you do all that stuff in Unity. Uh, let's quickly just run through them. Now the on spit hit damageable function is basically the same as what it was before, the on hit damageable function. It, nothing's really changed. Uh, this find surface function that's being called, which is actually located down here, not touching that. We're also telling uh, the PE event to stop playing. And then we're also using a play one shot uh, to tell the impact event uh, to play. So the impact event is at the moment just a string holding the event path uh, for this here, the spit impact, obviously. <sighs> obviously because this is for the spit uh, projectile we're talking about. Let's go back into our script. And for the on bullet hit damageable function, it works a little bit differently. First two lines are the same. We're calling the find surface function and we're telling the first event to stop. This time, however, instead of using a one shot, uh, we're going to create the instance and destroy it ourselves and play it ourselves so we can use that parameter we looked at earlier. So what we want to write is fmod.studio.event instance and then give it a name, bullet impact. So that creates an event instance variable. Then using the equal sign, we want to assign it uh, an instance. So we write fmodunity.runtimemanager create instance and then feed it that string we created at the top which remember is holding uh, the event path of that event I just played or sorry the event path in this case for the bullet let's go back to fmod of the bullet impact event which like I said earlier can only play one of two events and that's it next we're using attach instance to game object again so write fmod unity dot runtime manager attach instance to game object we want to give it the uh, event bullet impact that we've just created we then want to tell it to play it at a certain location now we want to tell it to play it at the location uh, of basically wherever this hit now remember this is assuming we hit something that can be damaged and if we can if it can be damaged we'll do this in a bit but our parameter will be set to two and that will play the bullet impact enemy event we looked at earlier. Because of this, we want to play this event at the location of the enemy that got hit. The way we do that is by using this parameter variable I talked about earlier. So like I said, this is basically holding information on whatever object in our game uh, took, the, took the hit and got damaged because it's got the damageable script. It should have the damageable script attached to it. Uh, so we can store a reference of that script inside this here by using uh, the damageable class as the reference data type. In other words, long story short, a reference to uh, one of our enemies is stored inside this variable here. So what we could do is use that to find the location of it. So what you can see I've done is basically taken that variable and then access the transform component of it. So we can use that to find out the position of it as well. Next, we want to give it uh, some rigid body information. Now you can see I've wrote get component rigid body 2D, but by doing that, I've, just, I've literally just realized uh, that is not using the correct rigid body. By writing it as it is, what that's doing is taking into account the physics of, if it's got one, uh, does it have a rigid body? Oh, it does, there we go. So it's taking into account the rigid body of the bullet itself. Really, we should be taking into account the rigid body of the enemy that's just taken the hit because obviously it's not going to move, but if that did move through physics, uh, we want the impact sound to be playing from that location and not the bullet itself. So what I'm going to do is quickly change that. I'm going to, instead of writing it as that, I'm going to do the same thing I've done here with a damage uh, for the transform thing. I'm going to write to the uh, parameter damageable, uh, just like this, if I can remember how to spell damageable. Oh God, then write dot. Uh, and now we'll be getting the rigid body component from the enemy itself that took the damage. Next, we want to set the value of the parameter. Now we know because this is being called in the on bullet hit damageable function, that this has hit an enemy, it's hit something that can be damaged. Therefore, we know for a fact, we want to play uh, the bullet impact enemy event, as I mentioned earlier. Therefore, we also know for a fact that this parameter has to be two. So that's what we've done here. We're setting the bullet collide parameter that's stored within the uh, bullet impact event 
uh, to two. Now, if you're using f 2.0, you're gonna wanna write this differently. This command here, set bullet parameter, sorry, set parameter value is now obsolete. So what you're gonna wanna do instead is write the uh, event instance uh, variable. Then you're gonna wanna write set parameter uh, by name. You're gonna add two brackets. You're gonna do the same thing as I've done up here. So you're gonna write the name of the uh, parameter itself. So let's write bullet collide. Then write the value, so it will be 2f, but you'll also want to basically uh, give it a true or false value. Now this true or false value is gonna determine whether or not you ignore the parameters seek speed. Now we looked at seek speed before, let's quickly go back to F mod. If I click on the parameter, we have a seek speed option, and this determines how long it takes for the parameter uh, to be set to its new value when we tell it to. Now we, are not using seeing speed is set by default to instant so if we go back to our script uh we could really write in theory write this anything if we wrote true what we'd be doing is ignoring uh the seek speed option and therefore it will set the parameter to two instantly if we write false we will be taking into account the seek speed uh option however it's already set to instant. So either way, uh, the parameter is going to be set to two instantly. So it doesn't matter in this case, whether you write true or false, just make sure you do write one of them. Uh, then we want to end it with a semicolon and we're good to go. Now, obviously because I'm actually using FMOD, as I said earlier, I'm using FMOD 1.10.10. Therefore it doesn't recognize, the API doesn't recognize this line, so it doesn't work for me. But if you're using FMOD two or above, you're going to want to use this instead of this, okay? So I'm just gonna quickly delete this line here. Last but not least, you want to tell the event to actually start playing uh, and also add the release command so that when it's finished playing, it, the event instance will be destroyed. Finally, we've got the on hit non damageable function. Uh, now, I'm actually not calling this at all for the spit projectile because I don't want any uh, sound to play when it hits something that uh, doesn't take damage. In fact, I'm not even sure if it can. I've only ever seen it collide with Ellen, but there you go. So this will only be called uh, when the bullet hits something that can't be damaged, like a wall. Uh, as you can see, we're stopping the PE event from playing, the sort of bullet whizzy sound as it flies through the air. And then we're using a play one shot to play the impact event, uh, and we're telling it to play at the location of the game object itself. So as opposed to this function here, where we wanted all this sound to play at the location of the enemy it hit. This time we just want the event to play at the location of the bullet itself, because that will obviously you know, be where you expect to hear the fizzle out where it collides with the wall. Now, we're using the play one shot attached command instead of doing what we did here, create our own event instance so we could you know, tell the parameter to set a value to it. Reason why is because we don't have to. By default, if I go back to F mod, by default I've made sure that this parameter, if I'm gonna double check, uh, is set to one by default. So to do that, you right click and click set as initial value. Uh, so it will, if we just left this as it are and didn't touch the parameter and just hit play, we'll actually hear the bullet fizzle out sound on an object as opposed to hitting an enemy when it's on two. So that's why we can get away with just using a play one shot here and we don't have to tell the parameter uh, to set itself to a certain value. And with that, I think we're good to go. So let's quickly hit control S and save our script. And to finish this lesson off, we're just gonna quickly jump into the game uh, have a listen to how the bullet sounds when it hits uh, an object and an enemy. So I'm going to quickly hit maximize on play because to get the full effect of this, you kind of want this to be on full screen. There we go. So let's quickly play our scene. Okay. So the first thing we want to test is to see if we can hear the bullet when it's off screen. So let's just quickly move the camera over here. Uh, oh, wrong button. Let's quickly, <laughs> let's quickly fire the gun. So as the bullet leaves the screen, we can still sort of hear it fizzle out as it drifts off into the distance. That's good. Next, let's quickly get a wall on screen. So let's quickly move over here. There we go. And if we fire against the wall, there we go. So when it hits the wall, we hear that little fizzly out sound because it's hit an object that can't be damaged and doesn't have the damageable script attached to it. Uh, in this case, the door doesn't have that script attached to it. Now let's go find an ourselves an enemy and let's see what happens when we shoot it. So let's quickly get that in there. Right, so I'm gonna quickly shoot this enemy over here. <laughs> well, okay, so there's a lot going on there, but hopefully you heard uh, a kind of lasery zap sound when we hit the enemy. In fact, I'm gonna try and find another just so we can demonstrate that again. There we go, so you should have heard a pew when we hit the enemy, and we know it's working, Way! Now, this will work perfectly with uh, the uh, spitters and the chompers. Uh, there is a boss in this game, which we are going to look at at some point. 
Uh, it might sound a bit weird us playing that event with the boss because the boss isn't very fleshy. We might want to play a different event. If that's the case, uh, we will basically have to add another section to this parameter, extend its max and min values and create another event for the boss itself. But we'll cross that bridge, I think, when we get to the boss. And so with that, that's everything for this lesson. So I've been Henry Scott. Thank you loads for watching and I will see you in the next one.